I want to start um, by asking you to picture your average day, your activities in your average day, and think about that infrastructure that actually gets you to do those things, that allows you to get from one place to the other, is efficient in terms of the time you have, and adds value to your life because it allows you to do a lot of things which otherwise you wouldn't be able to. That infrastructure is your transportation system. It's your transportation system that allows you to take all these opportunities to learn, work, have fun, and do basically whatever you want to do, wherever you want to do. But how do we want to move? And how do we want to move in the future? Think a bit about it. You probably want to be endlessly mobile, no barrier to distance, no friction, um, with little effort as possible, and uh, with as much um, or little time as possible. That is Star Trek, teletransportation. And that is fiction. So I'm going to bring you back a bit to reality because reality is a bit different. And I would like to take a few minutes to show you um, your reality. So for those of you who did a project in secondary school about transport, um, I, I, I was a geek even back then. Um, sorry. Um, uh, you will know that in the history of transport there is uh, walking and then um, your horse-drawn vehicles, your steam engine, your train, your cars, your planes. Well, you get it. Every time we um, looked at technology, every time there was a new technology, um, we found that um, you moved faster and to a certain extent the world became smaller. Now, in trying to resolve much of the problems of getting over space, we've created an even longer list of problems, primarily for us, but also for the environment. And it is that same environment which actually helps us sustain life. So, this is where I think a lot of people are in denial. Malta is, or the love affair with the car that we have in Malta, is, is very evident. We have more cars than actual drivers. Even babies have cars. And uh, if, if you had to put the pile of cars one next to each other or after each other, we have enough cars to cover us all the way to Rome and from Rome to Malta. And to accommodate all those cars, we've actually built an infrastructure that takes us all the way to London. That's over 2,000 kilometers of roads in an island which barely is visible in a map of Europe. But it's not only about the numbers, it's about the use. We do over 70% of our trips with the car, and 14% of those are within our localities. And if you're Maltese, you know the size of our localities. They're tiny. And then we drive three times all our infrastructure in a year on average. So I hear some of you say, where do we go? Well, I have that existential question as well. And I think everybody who does that kind of mileage in air should ask himself that kind of question. So we burn fuel using very old cars and causing lots of pollution. And let's not forget that air pollution in Malta causes over 200 deaths a year. Then there is noise pollution, there is road accidents, there is climate change adaptation, and of course, congestion. I know it's a bit painful today, but anyway. Congestion, you those long trails of cars, idle engines on, waiting to be served with some space. And space is something which we all know is very scarce, but not because it's Malta, it's everywhere. The endless demand for space for endless driving is not available anywhere. It's a matter of price, but I'm not going to discuss price today. It's another topic for another talk, maybe. So the reality is one full of pollution where I cannot enjoy my streets, I cannot walk, I cannot cycle. I am, on the other hand, frustrated, stuck in a car, and wasting too much time in transit. I'm not really enjoying the life that you would expect living in a beautiful Mediterranean island. As a little child, I used to watch a lot of Italian television, and they were really, really good at designing these adverts about beautiful cars, beautiful people,
driving these cars. And of course, driving along these beautiful, long, empty roads. So I got my driving license. And then I was very disappointed because uh, I, I'm generally a very short person, so I drive like this. No one sees me. Um, my heart, <laughs> my hair was always in a mess, and so I never looked good. And uh, most of the time, I'm stuck behind someone else. So, yeah, those advertorials kind of were a disillusion and uh, the frustration uh, at having sort of to wait, even though, of course, this technology made that frustration easier by providing us with Candy Crush or, or a tune on your phone. So the dream of endless mobility hits reality. Are we going to continue driving to oblivion, thinking that traffic will get better eventually? I can already hear comments here thinking, if only governments would provide more roads, uh, if only contractors would build b b bigger parking spaces, you know, if everyone could just get out of the way and let me drive. Well, that's, no, that's selfish. You shouldn't think that. So the, the reality, or another reality, is that no one really cares of the impact on others. We get angry with the people in front of us when we suffer road rage instead of feeling really bad about the road rage that we're causing to the guys behind us. We are always ready to blame everybody else, but never ourselves. I've, abu I've, I've experienced abuse three times this month. The first one was for cycling and not getting out of the way in a five meter wide road, i.e. I couldn't get out of the way. The second one was for the time it takes to put a child on a van. And the third time, for parking legally and being blocked by someone who parked illegally. We are progressively forgetting that humans are first and cars are just vehicles. We remove pavements to add more parking. And what we have left in terms of pavements are in a sad state. They are over-designed, under-designed, or simply not designed at all. We introduce one-way systems that allow more space for cars to speed up, making everything around that space dangerous for anyone outside the car. We continue building more and realizing that we have reached um, you know, a capacity of our towns, of our streets, unless of course, unless of course, our vision of our streets are endless rows of parking lots instead of houses, and endless layers of highways or streets or roads. I remember going to Bangkok in 1998. A long time ago, you say, but even at the time, it already had supra-elevated highways. 10 lanes of traffic at the ground, 10 lanes of traffic over ground, crossing against the tall buildings, endless car you know, queues, and of course, unbearable pollution. Is that what we want? I have been recently talking about um, giving streets back to people and replacing parking with pavements for the safe passage of people, for people to be able to enjoy the outdoors, socialize with people. Because yes, there are such things as friends and neighbors. Those people that you wave beyond the traffic, because it's human nature to be wanting to socialize with people outside. But we can't because there's a barrier of course between us. And there, of course, are the children, the opportunity for the children to be able to go and buy milk by themselves. Gain their independence. Be curious about exploring the environment, what lies out outdoors, the danger, the fear, learning all the stuff. Sadly, I have students who don't know their neighbors. I've been asking this question for a long, very long time now. And worst of all, have never used the bus. It's showing up in the numbers now. This means that these individuals have never socialized. They've never went outside. These kids definitely don't get the feel of curiosity, danger, fear of the outdoors. So what kind of individuals will they grow into? Giving streets back to people has all sorts of implications for communities as well as on health. 
Another shocking statistic, of course, is obesity in this island. We started with kids at the beginning of the century. Now we are also having adults topping the list in the world. If only we shifted that 14% of trips from cars to walking in our locality, that's your first bit of activity there. I think the challenge lies in primarily getting people to remember that they have legs and sometimes legs are faster. So what I advocate here is, um, you know, a world where people think about the travel and act rationally. If you are going to the supermarket to buy milk, go to your local grocer and walk. Plan your shopping, organize your meetings in a day, coordinate um, your work, and, you know, use your car wisely and not frivolously. Most important, I understand that change is difficult, but not impossible. Nothing is impossible. With many more people wanting better walkways, if you think about it, governments will shift their attention. They will shift their attention to providing ro from, you know, roads for cars to roads for people. On the other hand, if we wait for governments, it will take too long. If we decide to try it out ourselves, chances are that we are more successful. Even cutting one car trip a day a week can have significant implications on pollution and, and, and um, congestion. And I, I, I sort of start closing with a very simple message. Respect is a very old value which, if applied appropriately, will solve many of the problems we face on a daily basis. Respect drivers, don't stop in the road. Respect the space, park appropriately and park in your garage. Respect pedestrians, they are more vulnerable than you in the car. So they should have priority over you. And four, respect others by making choices wisely about your mobility. Because chances are that if you are wise about your choices and respect others, they will respect you back. That kind of reciprocity um, actually helps the system. I've worked in government most of my life, uh, sorry, in academia most of my life, and I've consulted for government for a good part of that life. And I appreciate the difficulties in government. There are plenty of barriers, this is one of the projects, um, to getting things done. Um, you know, getting something like this done. Frustrating? <laughs> yes, of course. However, I'm a very strong believer in the power of the citizen. The citizen that can engage with the community, and rather than demand, as we always do, we drive the change. If we postpone change to the next generation, we're losing another generation. And it might be too late. Sustainability principles talk about equity between generations and among generations. So what we want to leave our children is something we do now, ourselves. The health and environmental problems coming from transport are increasing at a very, very fast rate. Now we cannot ignore it, just like, you know, some elephant in the room. There are solutions which are really simple, and we are in charge. So let's start by making those changes happen and ensuring that the next generation not only understands why we are doing this, but follow us so that we can have a better world. Thank you. Thank you.